Although the astronauts were confident it would work, they were concerned it might fire in an unexpected manner, necessitating an early end to the mission. The burns would be computed from the ground but the final work in maneuvering up to the SIVB would require Izel to use the telescope and sextant to compute the final burns, with Shira applying the ship's reaction control system thrusters. Izel was startled by the violent jolt caused by activating the SPS. The thrust caused Shira to yell, Yabba Dabba Do, in reference to the Flintstones cartoon. Shira eased the craft close to the SIVB, which was tumbling out of control, successfully completing the rendezvous. The first television broadcast took place on October 14. It began with a view of a card reading, from the lovely Apollo room high atop everything, recalling taglines used by band leaders on 1930s radio broadcasts. Cunningham served as camera operator with Izell as MC. During the seven-minute broadcast, the crew showed off the spacecraft and gave the audience views of the southern United States. Shira held another sign, keep those cards and letters coming in folks, another old-time radio tagline that had been used recently by Dean Martin. This was the first live television broadcast from an American spacecraft. According to Jones, these apparently amiable astronauts delivered to NASA a solid public relations coup. Daily television broadcasts of about 10 minutes each followed, during which the crew held up more signs and educated their audience about spaceflight. After the return to Earth, they were awarded a special Emmy for the telecasts. Later on October 14, the craft's onboard radar receiver was able to lock onto a ground-based transmitter, again showing a CSM in lunar orbit could keep contact with the LM returning from the moon's surface. Throughout the remainder of the mission, the crew continued to run tests on the CSM, including of the propulsion, navigation, environmental, electrical and thermal control systems. All checked out well. According to authors Francis French and Colin Burgess, the redesigned Apollo spacecraft was better than anyone had dared to hope. Izel found that navigation was not as easy as anticipated, he found it difficult to use Earth's horizon in sighting stars due to the fuzziness of the atmosphere, and water dumps made it difficult to discern which glistening points were stars and which ice particles. By the end of the mission, the SPS engine had been fired eight times without any problems. One difficulty that was encountered was with the sleep schedule, which called for one crew member to remain awake at all times, Izel was to remain awake while the others slept, and sleep during part of the time the others were awake. This did not work well, as it was hard for crew members to work without making a disturbance. Cunningham later remembered waking up to find Izel dozing. Shira was angered by NASA managers allowing the launch to proceed despite the winds, saying, the mission pushed us to the wall in terms of risk. Jones said, this pre-launch dispute was the prelude to a tug of war over command decisions for the rest of the mission. Lack of sleep and Shira's cold probably contributed to the conflict between the astronauts and mission control that surfaced from time to time during the flight. The testing of the television resulted in a disagreement between the crew and Houston. On day 8, after being asked to follow a new procedure passed up from the ground that caused the computer to freeze, Izel radioed, we didn't get the results that you were after. We didn't get a damn thing, in fact. You bet your ass. As far as we're concerned, somebody down there screwed up royally when he laid that one on us. Shira later stated his belief that this was the one main occasion when Izel upset Mission Control. The next day saw more conflict, with Shira telling Mission Control after having to make repeated firings of the RCS system to keep the spacecraft stable during a test, I wish you would find out the idiot's name who thought up this test. I want to find out, and I want to talk to him personally when I get back down. Izel joined in, while you were at it, Find out who dreamed up, P-22 Horizon Test, that is a beauty also. C. A further source of tension between Mission Control and the crew was that Shira repeatedly expressed the view that the re-entry should be conducted with their helmets off. He perceived a risk that their eardrums might burst due to the sinus pressure from their colds, and they wanted to be able to pinch their noses and blow to equalize the pressure as it increased during re-entry. This would have been impossible wearing the helmets. Over several days, Shira refused advice from the ground that the helmets should be worn, stating it was his prerogative as commander to decide this, though Slayton warned him he would have to answer for it after the flight. Shira stated in 1994, in this case I had a cold, and I'd had enough discussion with the ground, and I didn't have much more time to talk about whether we would put the helmet on or off. I said, essentially, I'm on board, I'm commanding. They could wear all the black armbands they wanted if I was lost or if I lost my hearing but I had the responsibility for getting through the mission. No helmets were worn during the entry. Director of Flight Operations Christopher C. Kraft demanded an explanation for what he believed was Shira's insubordination from the Capcom, Stafford. Kraft later said, 
Shiro was exercising his commander's right to have the last word, and that was that. Apollo 7 splashed down without incident at 11 hours 11 minutes and 48 seconds Coordinated Universal Time on October 22, 1968, 200 nautical miles SSW of Bermuda and 7 nautical miles north of the recovery ship USS Essex. The mission's duration was 10 days, 20 hours, 9 minutes and 3 seconds. NASA awarded Shira, Izell and Cunningham its Exceptional Service Medal in recognition of their success. On November 2, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson held a ceremony at the LBJ Ranch in Johnson City, Texas, to present the astronauts with the medals. He also presented NASA's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, to recently retired NASA Administrator James E. Webb, for his outstanding leadership of America's space program since the beginning of Apollo. Johnson also invited the crew to the White House, and they went there in December 1968. Despite the difficulties between the crew and mission control, the mission successfully met its objectives to verify the Apollo Command and Service Module's flightworthiness, allowing Apollo 8's flight to the moon to proceed just two months later. John T. McQuiston wrote in the New York Times after Izell's death in 1987 that Apollo 7's success brought renewed confidence to NASA's space program. According to Jim Lovell, Apollo 7 was a very successful flight, they did an excellent job but it was a very contentious flight. They all teed off the ground people quite considerably, and I think that kind of put a stop on future flights for them. Shira had announced, before the flight, his retirement from NASA and the Navy, effective July 1, 1969. The other two crew members had their spaceflight careers stunted by their involvement in Apollo 7. By some accounts, Kraft told Slayton he was unwilling to work in future with any member of the crew. Cunningham heard the rumors that Kraft had said this and confronted him in early 1969. Kraft denied making the statement, but his reaction wasn't exactly outraged innocence. Izell's career may also have been affected by becoming the first active astronaut to divorce, followed by a quick remarriage, and an indifferent performance as backup CMP for Apollo 10. He resigned from the astronaut office in 1970 though he remained with NASA at the Langley Research Center in Virginia until 1972, when he was eligible for retirement. Cunningham was made the leader of the astronaut office's Skylab division. He related that he was informally offered command of the first Skylab crew, but when this instead went to Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad, with Cunningham offered the position of backup commander, he resigned as an astronaut in 1971. Shira, Izell, and Cunningham were the only crew, of all the Apollo, Skylab and Apollo Soyuz missions, who had not been awarded the Distinguished Service Medal immediately following their missions. NASA Administrator Michael D. Griffin decided to belatedly award the medals to the crew in October 2008, F, or exemplary performance in meeting all the Apollo 7 mission objectives and more on the first crewed Apollo mission, paving the way for the first flight to the moon on Apollo 8 and the first crewed lunar landing on Apollo 11. Only Cunningham was still alive at the time as Izell had died in 1987 and Shira in 2007. Izell's widow accepted his medal, and Apollo 8 crew member Bill Anders accepted Shira's. Other Apollo astronauts, including Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Alan Bean, were present at the award ceremony. Kraft, who had been in conflict with the crew during the mission, sent a conciliatory video message of congratulations, saying, We gave you a hard time once but you certainly survived that and have done extremely well since. I am frankly, very proud to call you a friend. The insignia for the flight shows a command and service module with its SPS engine firing, the trail from that fire encircling a globe and extending past the edges of the patch symbolizing the Earth orbital nature of the mission. The Roman numeral 7 appears in the South Pacific Ocean and the crew's names appear on a wide black arc at the bottom. The patch was designed by Alan Stevens of Rockwell International. In January 1969, the Apollo 7 command module was displayed on a NASA float in the inauguration parade of President Richard M. Nixon, as were the Apollo 7 astronauts. After being transferred to the Smithsonian Institution in 1970, the spacecraft was loaned to the National Museum of Science and Technology, in Ottawa, Ontario. Currently, the Apollo 7 CM is on loan to the Frontiers of Flight Museum at Love Field in Dallas, Texas. On November 6, 1968, comedian Bob Hope broadcast one of his variety television specials from NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston to honor the Apollo 7 crew. Barbara Eden, star of the popular comedy series One Dream of Genie, which featured fictional astronauts among its regular characters, appeared with Shira, Izell, and Cunningham. Shira parlayed the head cold he contracted during Apollo 7 into a television advertising contract as a spokesman for Actift, an over-the-counter version of the medicine he took in space. 
The Apollo 7 mission is dramatized in the 1998 miniseries From the Earth to the Moon episode, We Have Cleared the Tower, with Mark Harmon as Shira, John Meese as Izel, Frederick Lane as Cunningham and Nick Searcy as Slayton.